Um, but that's 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 good. I, yeah. it's, it's a good kind of sore. This is your marathon preparation, I take it? That's right. I'm running the Berlin Marathon in September. Yeah. That's not the kind of thing you should do without practicing, I imagine. Um, well, I, I, I don't want to try doing it without practice. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practicy kind of guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, sure there'll be some people who, I'm sure there'll be some people who kind of show off and busk it, but that's, <laughs> that's not really my style. I can't imagine that ends well for them. No. So, uh, we have a theme. A theme tune. Yeah, you're right. Um, you'd probably better talk about that because yeah. you lost me slightly with it. Um, right. Hello, listeners, by the way. That theme tune you, you heard at the start was, was written by Colin. Um, yes. and he's probably going to want to tell you about why it sounds like it does. Right. Um, so our podcast title is Wrong But Useful, uh, which is a, a quote from a gentleman called George Box who sadly died like the day the podcast went live uh, last month um, um, but one, one of the things that Box discovered or came up with was a, a system of doing experiments um, that so if you've got say three variables that you want to control for rather than doing every possible combination of, of all three you, you just do a certain selection of them and I used that as inspiration for for the music. I started with a C major chord and thought about how I could alter that. I could alter the alter the rhythm. I could alter the um, each of the notes up and down a bit. I could um, I think those those were the main things. And so I, I kind of applied um, Box's idea to the C chord and stuck a nice little bring at the end and that, that was the theme hmm. so that's for those people that are into music we now have a theme tune that is actually inspired by the name of our title which I think is quite awesome person. and also I didn't do it quite right so I feel <laughs> that it it kind of epitomizes the show in that it is not just a box thing but it is also wrong but useful yeah because uh, one of the uh, many comments that we had after our last show, um, thank you to everybody for that. Um, there was somebody was saying about how you know they they enjoyed what we were talking about, but they felt that the start was a little bit jarring, and admittedly the end was a bit jarring as well. That's simply because we hadn't really planned it very well. Um, and we're new to this. So, hey, you can lay off us. This is our, <laughs> our first time. Yeah, I, I took it in a sort of supportive, critical friend kind of way. You've obviously. <laughs> Attacking vindictive manner. Yeah, well, I, I, <laughs> that that that, ro that roller. I'm <laughs> yeah. Um, just whilst we're on that topic, then again, we, so, so we we put this up on your blog on the twenty eighth of March, um, and I was dead impressed very quickly to see that we were racking up the comments until I realised that every time I tweeted about it, yes. it logged that in the comments. Yeah. Um, so. I'm still convinced that lots of people talked about it. Yes, um, but most of them uh, were you. Well, y yeah, but I also think, <laughs> yeah, apart from me, I still think lots of people talked. It's, about it's it. just true. I've got way more traffic on that um, on that post than I've had on any article ever. So that, that, that's good. Do you have um, any figures, or is that too early to get into oh, that? I, 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 I could acquire some figures. That's a... okay. I'll just mention some people that said some yeah. nice stuff. Um, so we had a, we had um, obviously we've got to start with Peter Rowlett because being one of the inspirations, if you like, for this, um, he's written a, an A periodical post about what he's called pretenders to the throne of um, mm -hmm. of the the Math Maths podcast, um, in which he mentions us and uh, you know is broadly quite nice, I think, about it. Um, Drew Barker, who's at twenty three on Twitter. Uh, he just sort of said he commented and he enjoyed it, and he and he, I think he's the person that suggested we should have a start and an end as well, which is fair enough. See, listeners, we listen. We're doing things. Although like we did, we didn't um, we didn't do an end. Well, so we haven't. No, true, but we haven't got to the end yet. No, um, yeah, we've got a, we've got some time to think of how we're going to end. Yeah. But you know, okay, we half listen to you guys. We do some of what you say. Um. A few people mentioned the fact that it's nice to hear people rambling about maths. Now, 
uh, again, I take that as a positive thing, but I'm unclear about the choice of the word rambling. It's like they're suggesting we also didn't have any structure, which is quite fair, true. Fair enough, yeah. Uh, I, I have numbers. Uh, Wrong But Useful had 640 page views, um, which... That sounds pretty but, good to me. Yeah, my, my homepage got 370, and the Carnival of Maths, which I ran last month, got less than 350. So that's yeah, that's quite a because okay. Carnival of Maths is a is a sort of pretty big thing, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, happy with that. Obviously, yeah. looking for more this. <laughs> yeah, once our uh, loyal following. Develops will be yeah expands. I mean, one of two things. This is what um, you know, music people would call the awkward second album. Yeah, you know, being an album, as it were. But I think we got the well. We tried to get the awkwardness out of the way first time. Yeah, true. Um, there was one guy, Chris Smith, who um, I contact quite a lot on Twitter. He's at uh, AAP. 03102, which I now realize makes me ask him, I should ask him why he has such a daft name, but um, yeah, I think he's in the comments as well, and he said, oh, he enjoyed listening to it. Does he get a certificate for completing it? Hmm. Which again, I take this as a positive thing, but my first thought was going, what, is this some sort of ordeal that you have to get through that you deserve a reward for? <laughs> we deserve the certificate. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but he should give us a certificate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you, but you did make a certificate for him. I was very... I very, oh, yeah. very pleased with the certificate. Handcrafted, no less. Yeah. I unfortunately tweeted it to him, didn't I? You, and I left did. it blank. Mm -hmm. So I'm now we were all worried that other people would have just printed this one out, filled in their own names without even bothering to listen to it, which yeah, well, yeah. an error, frankly. Yes. It, it's, 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 there are no depths that some people will not sink to. <laughs> um, Again, lots and lots of other people talk to us, um, but two more I'd like to mention are at SR Cav, who thought it was interesting, and he's mentioned um, Sheldon Cooper's number. So Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory, um, and that he, I was asking people about their favorite numbers or coolest mm -hmm. numbers. Mm -hmm. So he's mentioned that. I guess we'll come back to that later, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, ah, oh, yeah, Mr. H at Singing Hedgehog. So he's got a comment on on your blog under the Wrong But Useful episode one. It's going to be a lot easier if people go and look at that, really. But he's he was taken with the idea of negative letters and found a pretty awesome way of writing them. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that was cool. I, I thought that was way beyond the, uh, <laughs> the call of duty. Yeah, and he's also putting some links there to decimal time as well, which I quite enjoyed having a look through. Um, right. Let's move on. Where would you like to start with the new stuff? Um, let, let's talk about um, queues. Okay. okay. Um, so I think did I mention this last time? Or oh, was it just afterwards? Um, no, you. It's just afterwards, I think. Yeah. So just after our last uh, episode, I had the pleasure of going to Euro Disney with my family and extended family, actually. Um, so Euro Disney is quite cool, but um, obviously they have queues for the rides, mm -hmm. uh, and this got me thinking, because I know this is an area of maths, it's kind of one of those, you know, obviously some areas of maths are quite esoteric, but making people queue less, everybody mm -hmm. obviously accepts that's quite useful. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't sure whether, ah, oh, okay, I wasn't sure whether Disney were doing it wrong. Um, so it's still wrong, but it would be useful. Mm -hmm. um, see what I did there? I did. Uh... Yeah. Um, and... They had um, starting, well, sort of at various points throughout the queue on some of them, they have a you know, waiting time from here is 15 minutes, or, mm. or if you're waiting for the princesses, Aaron and our Anna Howe for two hours. Um, but it was noticeable that, generally speaking, you didn't have to wait quite as long as they said you were going to have to wait. Mm. Um, and slightly by coincidence as well, on one of the occasions, my sister in law was given a sort of a what are they called? Uh, a thing around a neck. You know, uh, what are they Necklace? Called? No. Lanyard? That's the one, lanyard. Um, with a, a queuing time thing written on it. And, and she was asked to, when she got to the front of the queue, to give that in so that they'd had a sense, so they could measure how long she'd been actually mm. been queuing for. So she'd given it as soon as she joined the queue mm. and was asked to give that in when she got there. So I thought, okay, so they actually are doing something about this, or at least they're being seen mm. to do something about this. Yeah. 
Um, and then I read, so I tweeted about this or asked some people if they knew anything about relatively simple Q theory because, you know, didn't know much about it. And um, at Deveron3 sent me a link to, uh, well, it's another podcast from called 99% Invisible.org. And there's one on there on Q theory. And, and in there it does say um, it's one of the things about Qs. One way you can make Qs feel better is to make people feel that they're not wasting their time. Mm. So with lifts, that involves things like putting mirrors next to them. So whilst you're waiting for the lift, mm. you can be straightening your tie or you know checking your makeup or whatever it is. And uh, I mean, it's also nice when they've got like a, a dial or a um, that tells you where the lift is. Mm. Uh, and and one of the other things that, that was mentioned in there is that another thing that's done in Q3, and I think you may have even mentioned Disney, um, is to deliberately slightly overestimate so that you can make people, so when people have been queuing for half an hour mm. and yet being told they were going to have to wait 45 minutes, they feel like they've gained a quarter of an hour, yeah, not yeah. wasted half an hour. Mm. Uh, that's, that's kind of, I'm not sure if that's brilliant. Well, it is brilliant, but I'm not sure whether that's, uh, well, again, it's, the moral's a bit strong as well, but you know, if you know a little that's bit not the case, are you misinforming? I don't know. Hmm. Um, I, I, I would, that's probably going to work the first time. Mm, maybe. Yeah, I suppose that's true. If I went back again, I would hmm. aware that that seemed to happen, maybe. Um, but yeah, I don't think you're probably better to, um, to overestimate the queue time than underestimate it because, yeah. like, you, if you tell someone it's going to be half an hour and it's actually 45 minutes, then they're going to get cranky. Yeah. Whereas the other maybe, way around. Yeah. Maybe they're overestimating, you know, in a sort of a good kind of way, as it were, yeah. not intentionally misleading. Yeah. Um, I think I mentioned as well, I, was, I haven't done this yet, but I was planning on maybe coming up with a few resources that you could use in lessons where you sort of model some cues. Right, you said that on Twitter, yeah. Yeah, probably with Dice um, something. And, you know, I'd like to know whether, you know, the snake kind of queue, as it's called, it seems, the one that you get in cashier number two, please. Yeah. And you know, is that more efficient than having multiple queues where you pick your checkout and stick with it? I, I, th I think so. I, I think um, the, the queue will will finish more quickly with a, a snake queue, mm. but um, you Maybe. may get luckier with a... Because it's interesting... Um, See, I think it's interesting if you think um, some shops like Next and the post office have obviously gone with the cashier number two mm -hmm. system, uh, whereas noticeably, I don't know of any big supermarkets that use the snake. Uh, yeah, the, well, the you get the, like the Sainsbury's Metro mm. thing do that. Um, do they really? Oh, they okay. do. Uh, or whatever it's whatever it's Sainsbury's local. Um, uh, maybe I've seen that for sort of like the little. If it's like you've only got a basket of stuff. Maybe. Yeah. I wonder if it's just the logistics of queuing people with trolleys would take a yeah. lot of space. Well, you, yeah, there, there's certainly that. Um, I, I quite like the Argos system where you get a ticket and you sit down. Uh, yeah, I, I think I quite like that too as well. Um, I mean, that wouldn't work obviously in somewhere like. You know, Sainsbury's or Tesco's, but mm. uh, I don't know. If you yeah. just go put put your put your trolley, you know, park your trolley, go and sit down, and when they're ready to to run it through, you you yeah. go like, to the other side. I, that, 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 if I ran a supermarket, that's how it would be. <laughs> okay, shop, shop and beverages. Yeah, I was going to say beverages actually does work as a name, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Might have to be clear. You sell food as well, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Um, well, that's that's sort of on the lines of there's lots of maths I don't know about still, but that's one that oh, I'm too. kind of quite interested in. Um, so if anybody does have any links to some, again, it's got to be fairly entry level on this because I don't know anything about it at all. Um, but, you know, fairly simple models of different types of things. I mean, the I think I did see uh, somebody's... Uh, I can't remember what it was, but I saw something on the internet about somebody was saying about how there's different behaviours as well. You get people who are sort of queue jumping, mm -hmm. and you get the um, there are people who will put their children in two different queues, put themselves in one queue, and then whichever right. one gets there first, 
you know, just switch over. And I definitely remember doing that when I was younger. I, I, um, the, the friend in Norway was complaining that the custom in Norway is, is if you have a kid, you get to jump the queue. Oh, okay. Well, um, you, sorry? Regardless of the type of shop. Uh, well, I think this was particularly in a coffee shop. Um, okay. Uh, um, yeah, it, it was... <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't have a kid, so she was very distressed that she had to mm. <laughs> kept get into the front of the queue, and then people kept. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Getting ahead. I think the um again, I really should go and find the document. But it was talking about uh, there are some places that have sort of developed dual queuing systems where you give some people priority, mm. and the sort of thing you see at airports where if you've got like a special pass, then you get a different queue to go through, and actually um. Disney did this as well a little bit. If you if you're a bit more organised and could and knew about them, there's this thing called Fast Pass. Yeah, where you can go and swipe your tickets, um, and then it gives you a time to return. And when you return at yeah. that time, you join a much shorter queue. You know that's quite good. And we yeah. had the advantage of going people that had gone before, so they knew about this, and mm. and and we did that quite a few times. And it does save a lot of time, mm. and feels makes you feel slightly smug as you watch all the other people in the longer queue. Yes, of course. Um, and, and feeling smug about stuff is really what matters about. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know stuff you don't know. That's, yeah. that's pretty much the premise of people doing that, isn't it? I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on. You, your turn to choose. Um, well, you chose something that I've put in our list, so let's go with, uh, I'm, I think, best strategy for battleships. Is that yours? Yeah, it was something I was wondering about, because I, um, I put a, a game up on my site that mm -hmm. used to be on my other site uh, it's coordinate battleships so okay. you, you have to type in the, the coordinates of the, the point where you think the, the aircraft carrier is and yeah. sync them all and I was trying to figure out well if you were <laughs> playing professional battleships yeah don't laugh what, what, <laughs> yeah how, how would you do it what would you what would you do and it's is it kind in of, terms of placing your ships or sinking well, the other ships? Both. Because um, mm. the... Like, so if the ships are placed at random, obviously you, you, you want to hit in the middle first because there's, um, there's, there's more places, more ways the battleship could be there. Yeah, I guess uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, cor presumably corners are your worst bet. Yeah, exactly. Because um, you... So if, if if you're thinking about the middle square, say it's a, a ten by ten grid, you've got mm. well, eleven by eleven. Um, you've you've got five ways the battleship could be going across the way, five ways it could be going down the way. Whereas yeah. every other corner, you've only got two. There's one each yeah. one each way. Um, and but if you're <laughs> if you were trying to set things up so the other guy couldn't win, you probably want to put your stuff in the corner so that. It depends who you're playing against, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Depends who you're playing against. Because, because you know that. you're playing against someone who's going to put it in the corner. You, you guess in the corner, and it's. And then if you're playing against somebody who you think thinks that you're going to put it in the corner, then you double don't put it in. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah that's complex. It's game theory, yeah. It's, it's... Um, I suppose it would be a good idea to reduce it to a simpler game first. If you have like a three by three grid and you only put one boat on there, right? Maybe a, a too long. Whatever that boat's yeah. called, yeah. Um, cruiser. I, I don't know. Let's call yeah, it cruiser. Then, okay, so the middle square then three mm. by three grid. Um, middle square has it could be four different places yeah. that the boat could be, and it would yeah. be in the middle. If you're talking about center edge, then there are three different places, and the corners have only got two. So yeah, clearly you're. Yeah. If it is done randomly, then the middle one has a much mm. better chance. Mm. But if you miss in the middle, I guess you. I think you have an even chance of all the other squares. Uh, yeah, because all the others have now got only two possible ways, haven't they? Yeah, it, it, it develops quite quite oddly. I, I, I had a little look at it. So hmm. if anybody knows, if anybody knows what the best strategy for battleships is. I think the best strategy for battleships... Let, let us know. I'm pretty sure it's to cheat. I'm sure that's the way. You just don't put your ships on until near the end. Right. You yeah. miss... Miss, no, miss, miss, yeah. miss, miss. Damn it, I've only got one space left with the five thing could be. Yeah, you've hit there, well done, yeah. But you'd I'm have sure. won by then. And... 
Yeah, you've won by then because they're not cheating. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah, true. <laughs> so, draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Right. Good. You'll go, I reckon. Right. Are you got? <laughs> you got a thing about Peppa Pig? <laughs> yeah. Um, I I already knew this, but it was tweeted briefly by somebody. Um, in one of Peppa Pig's books, and it, I think it's called Peppa Pig Goes to Work. Right. Uh, and there's a there's it's a, a classic th- with Sushana. <laughs> Yes. Um, people who have children, mm. well, relatively young children, will understand mm. that some books are good, some books are rubbish, some books are tedious, and you can spot mm. the moral train coming mm. from miles away. Mm. Little Penguin was scared to swim. Then he saw Seal. Mm. Seal was a bit afraid, but then he managed to, oh, right, here we go. Um, and the best books, mm. chuck in little bits that amuse uh, the parents right. too, uh, and Peppa Pig is pretty good at doing that. Uh, and also Ben and Holly as well. If, yeah. Anyway, um, they're written by the same people. In one of Peppa Pig's books, where Peppa Pig goes to work, and he takes uh, Peppa Pig goes to work with her dad, right. and shows them around what they do. And there's a few different desks, and Mrs. Cat and Mr. Rabbit, I think, and whatever it is they're doing. And in Peppa Pig's section. Behind his desk, he's got a whiteboard that has the um, the the formula for solving a quadratic equation, which is rather cool. Um, so it has the, uh, the minus b plus or minus the square root of, and then under the square root is the capital delta sign, right. yeah. and that's all over two a. And then off yeah. to the side, it puts delta equals b squared minus four ac. Yeah, very nice. Which so is just one of those things that if you're a, well, and if you're a mathsy kind of parent, I guess you kind of go, that's quite cool because they've yeah. obviously. It's just gone one step beyond chucking some random maths in. Yeah. They've gone and substituted in the discriminant with capital delta. Now, is that a common thing? Is delta commonly used as a...? Um, I, I, I do try and get my students to remember it that way. Oh, right, okay. Um, like certainly in, in A level, just be, because you're getting used to the discriminant. Yeah. And I it, guess it helps them to figure out why it's, why it's useful. Okay. I mean, I've only Correct. really used the formula at GCSE, and we don't really worry too much about the discriminant then. It's when you get into A level, and I don't really, I don't teach the core maths parts, so I, I haven't really, I didn't know whether that was a general, yeah, this is what people do. The discriminant is called capital delta, or whether their book had just kind of made it up. For, well, they'd ask somebody, and they'd picked a letter. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how we're going to do a link in the show notes to that. Yeah. To be honest. Um. I'll let you worry about that. <laughs> um, okay. Next up. So you have, you've put, does 110% make sense? Hello? Oh, hang on. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting adaptation. Yeah, it said that my computer said it sounds like you're typing, so we've muted your mic, and I wasn't. It's lying. No. Um, it's, it also told me my network was experiencing difficulties. Oh, uh, okay. Poor, right. poor, poor network. But we, we can cut this bit out. Yeah, we can um, do. So, um, if you if you ever want to get a sense of um, despondency. I suggest you run a, a search for basic maths on Twitter. Um, really? Yeah, um, it's horrifying. The it, it's it's one of the phrases that I really used as an insult. <laughs> it's like you don't even know basic maths, or um, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's it's horrifying. But I have a, a book called Basic Maths for Dummies. Yeah. I'll get a uh, plug in for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say I was going because that's not the kind of thing I would randomly search for on Twitter. Yeah, but I guess yeah. you actually have a reason to do that. Yes, I do. And, um, but yes, yeah, so one of the people who was using it as an insult was saying, oh, but what I saw was 110 percent doesn't make sense. Basic maths." Mm-hmm. And I, I looked back to what he was talking about, and it was 110 percent increase. 
Yeah. Which absolutely does make sense. That that's completely natural. Mm-hmm. And so you you you're increasing by more than a whole thing. That that's that's totally all right. Yep. So I had a thousand pounds. If I was to increase it by a thousand pounds, that'd be a hundred percent. But obviously, a hundred times I could increase by one thousand one hundred pounds. Yeah, that's still yeah. plausible. I yeah. could increase by three hundred percent. But uh, if you're talking, well, yeah, if you're talking about I'm going to give a hundred hundred ten percent effort, yeah. then yeah, that, that, that's yeah. And there's a Simpsons episode where somebody is training the team and hypnotizing them, and all of the players, of which Homer is one, the coach goes. Right, I want you to give 110%, and you'll reply, you can't give 110%, 100% is the maximum percentage of energy you can give. Yeah. Um, have, you, have you seen Spinal Tap? No. Oh, that's... Similar uh, thing. Look, sorry? Similar well, thing. It's excellent, yeah. Um, but the one of the famous scenes in it is about um, the amplifiers go up to 11 because right. it's one louder. Okay, I have heard that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> T- terrific film. Re- really, one of the funniest films I've ever seen. Okay, you might have to look that up. Um, so, in answer to the question, does one hundred and ten percent make sense? That's it. Depends, doesn't it? Depends on the context. Yes. Mm. Um, could you ever? Can you reduce something by one hundred and ten percent? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, Are you? It depends, I suppose. Uh, well, yeah. I suppose you, if you reduced inflation by one hundred and ten percent, I suppose that would make sense. But, okay. but you, you probably wouldn't put it in those terms. That, no. That's just a bit confusing. If I can, I reduce my debt to somebody by one hundred and ten percent by making it so that they're in debt to me, maybe. Mm. Uh, again, I think that's that's technically accurate, but. Um, you, you probably wouldn't put it that way. Do that unless you were trying to confuse them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just wondered. Yeah. No. Good question. Um, okay. Tell Good. me about your Noughts and Crosses variant. The, this looks very, uh, very interesting. Yeah, I'm quite proud of this. I believe I've invented a game, basically. Yeah. Uh, so obviously not Noughts and Crosses because that's been around for a little while. Yeah. Um, and. So, uh, I was sent a tweet by a non-math person who'd observed a, uh, a lesson where the teacher was using a game, uh, it's the boxes game. So you have a grid of dots, and on your go you draw a line from one dot to another dot, you've got to go horizontal or vertical, and you're trying to complete a box. Right. You're staring yeah, blankly, yeah, no, have you no, never no, played you that game? Yeah, okay. Um, and so the, the maths variant of that is that in the boxes you have numbers and if you complete that box you score that number rather than just counting how many boxes it introduces an extra level of tactics because some boxes would be worth more than others. And I have played that with students before but it, I don't know, it, partly the problem is that you have to have a small grid to make it interesting. One of the biggest mistakes people play with boxes mm. is choosing a massive grid and yeah. it's very, very tedious for a very long time. Unless you're on like a plane um, or something. Well, yeah, okay, maybe. But then even then, I'd rather play multiple small games, I think. Um, yes, and and they do play it, and, you know, usually by the time they're getting near the end, they're just, it's it's actually creates extra tedium to then go, well, who's won? We'll have yeah. to add this all up, and it takes a long a long time. Could be great. Um, so I said, uh, you'd be better off playing noughts and crosses and putting numbers in the grid. So I created, uh, I think I just, I, mean, I did my drew it on paper and took a picture and stuck it on Twitter and on my blog as well. So I put some numbers in the boxes. And the principle is, if you play noughts and crosses, uh, if somebody wins in the normal way, then they just win. Mm-hmm. But if it's a draw, which of course lots of people know is very common in noughts and crosses, if it's a draw, then you look at the numbers of the places that you went in, mm-hmm. and you get that many points. Um, which I've played a few times. I haven't used it with a class yet, but I've played it a few times, and it is, does make it much more interesting hmm. because you can. I've had I've played against other teachers, and you can sometimes see games when they are worrying too much about with trying to get key numbers, mm-hmm. so you just win in the normal way. Right. And then it means that you know it it does change your strategy quite a lot. Um, 
And Chris Smith, who I mentioned earlier, has tried this with a class and he's kind of taken it to the next level perhaps. And he's put, um, so I think on mine I used just used integers and negative numbers, mm -hmm. so positive and negative numbers. Um, and he gone, he went for one with decimals in as well. Um, but the one I really liked is he used one where I think sort of the center right box is worth a million points. Right. And the rest are worth you know, no, no trivial numbers. Mm. Um, and that, that creates quite an interesting uh, view because you either need to make sure you get the million box mm -hmm. or win in the normal normal way. Yeah. Uh, it's genuinely an interesting game. I'm, uh, if I get around to it, I'll try and tweet people that go to Maths Jam to see if they can have a play of it. Yeah, you, um, you, you mentioned the problem with it in that the person who goes first has five shots. Yeah. Uh, did um, you come up with a good resolution for that? No. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, you just kind of reduce their uh, their score by twenty percent at the end. Yeah, you could do that. Or you could just not include the last box they pick, maybe, mm -hmm. or maybe not the first box they pick. I don't know. I haven't played around with it enough to. Um, maybe it's not refined enough yet, mm -hmm. but I think there's some scope in there to turn. You know, I quite like noughts and crosses as it is, frankly. Right. But um, yeah, I think there's enough in there to make it. Uh, ultimate noughts and crosses, I think. Yeah. I don't know what to call it, though. Because, yeah. you know, I need to get my name in there, really, I feel. <laughs> well, have a think about it. And if yeah. Any of our many listeners mm. have ideas for. What... I think we might be in double figures of listeners, you know. We, we were we... speculating sort of three or four last time. It could have been like a score or even. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I genuinely I'd try it. Find some unsuspecting person, mm -hmm. whack a grid up, just pick, stick random numbers in. It doesn't really matter, I don't think. Yeah. Um, whatever saying, numbers no, you pick creates an It could be game. quite good for getting um, A level students to remember their angle numbers. Yeah. Like cos yeah. 60 and that sort of stuff. Again, I can't remember if it was my idea or somebody else's idea, but you could put certs in there. Yeah. You could put, I, I suggested you could put a shape. In the box, and then if it's a draw, you get the sum of the angles of the shapes, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, okay. If you want to really force extra obvious maths into it somewhere, yeah, um, yeah, I'm I'm convinced it's quite a good game, frankly. Yeah, I'm quite proud of myself. <laughs> uh, okay, so I don't know, that is actually genius. I'm mm. quite impressed. I agree. In a completely modest way, obviously. Oh. Uh, you are reading something called Elliptical Tales. Yes. Um, Tell us about that. Right. It's a book I picked up in London the other week. Um, it's yeah. it's about elliptic curves, which is something that I've heard bits and pieces about. Um, right. Like it, Andrew Wiles used it to solve the uh, Fermat's Last Theorem. Uh, okay. Um, proof and. Um, I think they're, they're really quite a big topic in number theory. And are they easy enough to give a simple explanation, or? Yeah, they're, they're actually really they're, they're just a particular form of cubic equations. So, okay. Uh, y cubed. Um, so yeah, y squared equals x cubed plus a x plus b. I think where a a and b are integers. Right. Okay. So the, the the cubics, but it's it's a cubic that's all squared. Um, right. um, I haven't finished it yet. Um, it, it is very very good in explaining things like projective geometry and group theory and all of these things that I ought to know mm. loads of stuff about, but don't really. Okay. And it, it, the projective geometry in particular is something that's. I mean, I have kind of a, a vague understanding of what's going on, but it's not not particularly formal. But they do a really good job of explaining why why things are the way they are, and you know how to talk about points at infinity. And yeah, this is one one of the best best explained math books I've seen in a long while. Um. So how is it? Well, who's written it, and how is it written? Is it kind of sort of Fiction? Well, obviously not fiction. But no, no, it is the, the, the well, it, 
it's aiming towards an understanding of uh, the, the BSD conjecture. I don't know who BS and D are, yeah. um, but I understand it's one of the Millennium problems. Oh. And um, so they're, they're kind of building you up to all the stuff you need to understand the conjecture, uh, almost as a, an introductory course in uh, elliptic curves. But it's but it's very very you know most math writing is very terse and yeah and hard it, going I would say frankly sorry hard going yeah exactly and the, this really kind of breaks it down and you know, accepts that not everybody understands all of this stuff straight away it will remind you about things and it is written like um, written like you would teach it <laughs> okay yeah good. And um, you're talking about the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, I believe. Uh, that yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, just looked it up, obviously. That's, um... Yeah, I didn't hear that. I think your computer might be being rubbish. I'm oh, sorry. I, I was um, saying, it's Ash and Gross are the authors. Okay. Um, so yeah, what just, sort of level of people do you reckon could read this book? Um, I, I yeah. think it's probably uh, undergraduate level. Right. But, um, you know, there's not to say you can't give it a shot. If, uh, okay. If, 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 you, if you, dear listener, happen not to be. <laughs> I've, I've, I found it quite accessible. But I'm, I'm probably not a good person to judge whether something's accessible okay. or not. You don't count as normal in terms of maths understanding. No, no. Um, right. Okay, uh, I think we should move on to what I've, well, <laughs> what I've called our standing items. You know, things that we do every time. You know, yes. All, all two times now. Mm -hmm. Um. So last time, I asked people about the volume of a pyramid. Uh, we had a few people sort of try and help, um, and, and most people were sort of pointing towards the one I'd already heard of or knew about, where if you put the point in the corner uh, of a cube, uh, so start with the cube, if you put it in the corner, then you can imagine replicating that three times, and, and you get that it's a third, uh, with uh, sort of various rotations and transformations. Uh, and then I think you talked about imagining a a cuboid which is x by x on the base and then 2x tall. A 2h, 2h tall even. 2h tall I guess, yeah. Um, and yeah, that works out quite nicely if you imagine joining up the diagonals uh, to the, st well, joining up the corners to the center of the cube you get mm. six um, congruent well, pyramids. Yeah, congruent pyramids. And that was quite satisfying. Um, so I'm still, uh, I think I probably am slightly further on than I was, right. but I'm not sure I've gone as far as generalizing it and that it's obvious that this is always true. Well, I, I have an idea of how, how to explain So if you think of an actual pyramid as mm -hmm. like squares of stones, okay. one on top of the other. Um, if you kind of shift each layer of stones over into the corner. Or, yeah. Move it around so that they're in a. You've got straight lines from the corners to the peak. Yeah. You you don't change the areas of the layers of stones. So the volume doesn't change. Uh yeah okay I'm probably gonna have to think about that for a while but that yeah. does sound plausible. Um. Yeah. Okay, I will think about that. I think you might have done it. Okay. Yeah. I'll uh, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll think about it and probably talk about it again next time. Um, well done. Thank you. Um, and so last time I set the puzzle, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so my puzzle was if you have a sphere, it's from Martin Gardner. So if you have a sphere and you put pick three points at random on the sphere, mm -hmm. uh, what is the probability that all three points lay in the same hemisphere? And you can draw in you can draw in your your equator wherever you like. Yes. I, I have an answer for this. Okay. I, I, yeah. I reckon it's 100%. Yeah. I went with one. That's my probability. Yeah. 
Not 110%, obviously. No. That would be no. silly in this context. Uh, apparently, in quantum, you can use like probabilities that are greater than 1 and less than 0. Mm. Which I... Uh, <clears throat> if I, you I, can. I, no, nobody understands quantum, don't worry. If you can, then I think quantum is wrong. Uh, I do remember telling a... I had a further math student um, a while back, and when he was... You know, we'd finished the course and we're getting towards the end of sort of June and it was like he was ready to go off to university and stuff. And I went, right, it's great that you've finished your statistics course now. When you go to university, you'll learn about st um, probability, you know, properly and they'll show you the full probability scale. It, goes, it actually goes from zero to six. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I like it. Yeah. Worth doing. Do that if you have children. That, that, you know, you can do that too. Yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of that answer, then I agree. Uh, if you pick any two points, first of all, mm. um, then you can draw an equator that's going to go through them, mm. wherever they are. That's going to be doable. Um, and then the the third point will be either in on one side of well, it might be on top of that line, in which case it's fine, mm. um, or it's going to be on one side or the other side of it, and it's going to be in one of the two equators, so yeah. one of the two hemispheres. So, I thought about it in a slightly different way, that you, you can rotate the, the Earth so one of them's at the North Pole and then okay. twist it around so another one's on the like on a particular meridian. Yeah. And that, then that that's your okay. dividing line. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's basically the same thing, but, but it, it may. Yeah. <clears throat> I quite like that problem because it's it it's well I don't know. It's you can without too much thinking about it, you can you can get to a sort of a fairly satisfying and convincing yeah. answer. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and last time, because I think I did most of the work last time, mm -hmm. uh, you said you were going to come up with a puzzle this time. So have you got I one? Did. Yeah. Right. So this puzzle is about coins, and mm -hmm. I've got three coins. Yeah. Uh, two of which are biased. Um, one always gives you a head, one always gives you a tail, and the third coin is a fair coin. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I pick a coin out of my set of three, mm -hmm. completely at random. Presumably they're indistinguishable, you can't tell. The, of course, of course yeah. they are, yes. And I think goes without saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you toss it and you get the same thing both times. Okay, so either you get two heads oh, okay. or two tails. Um, what's the probability you have the fair coin? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. And if I did know, we wouldn't wouldn't answer it right now anyway. Exactly. Would we? Yes. Uh, okay. So that is open to people. If people want to give answers, you can either tweet it, or I don't know if it'll be too long for a tweet. Hmm. You could blog it. You could even probably email. I bet they can get your email yeah. through the blog, can't they? Yes, they can. Absolutely. It's uh, Colin at flyingcolorsmaths.co.uk. Okay, well, there you go. Um, yeah. Hmm. And if somebody has a good answer for that, then we'll, we'll talk about it. If not, I'll give my answer, and then you can tell me what, what your answer is. Yeah, excellent. Um, and also, I had to come up with something I didn't get or don't yeah. get. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the biggest thing I have at the moment is I'm not really sure why, multi why matrix multiplication works the way it works. You can kind of go across the first matrix and down the second matrix and add things up. And it, obviously it does work, but it just seems such a Byzantine way of combining two grids of numbers. I, I, I really don't understand why it, it, should, uh, it should all work out so nicely. Mm. I suppose one of the one of the things that I think automatically, if you had two three by three matrices mm. and you wanted to multiply them, then you'd sort of multiply the top corners together, mm. multiply the top middle ones right. together, and that would make sense. But then, of course, you can't multiply a three by three by a, a three by two if you right. use that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I think it might be something to do with um, dot products, um, okay. scalar products. But I I don't know. If anyone can enlighten me, I'd be very very grateful. Are you sort of interested in where this has come from, or you know? Um, I, I think I just just want a, a, a nice explanation of why why it should be that way rather than any other way. Hmm. Okay. 
Well, hopefully somebody, because uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer that one. But uh, hopefully somebody else might be able to for us. Right. Right. That's so nice. I think we've had your your musical introduction. Mm -hmm. We've talked about some mathsy kind of things that we've noticed we and um, sort of uh, read not readers, listeners' comments and thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, I should point out that I know I haven't listed everybody that that has got in contact with us because I did start doing that and then I it became a bit unmanageable. But thank you for everybody that said anything. Yeah. Uh, even, I mean, even the one person that said, "Well, I did start to listen to it, but I didn't really like it, so I stopped." You know, at least they tried. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we can, we can say whatever we like about them because they're not listening now. <laughs> I suppose that's true. <laughs> there was the danger that they might give the second one. I suppose if they give the second one a go. Mm. Uh, well, are they going to make it at the end? I yeah, I don't know. Well, I won't name him just in case. No, okay. But um, just in case he does this, I'll go, thank you for your comment anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we've done that. We talked about some maths. We talked about the puzzle we did last time. Mm -hmm. Talked about the thing I didn't know last time. Mm -hmm. Set a new one. Mm -hmm. Set a new thing you don't know. Mm -hmm. So we need a way to ending. We've got through to the end, and I haven't thought about a way to end this. Well, how about we we say goodbye and then I I, I splice in the the theme music without any kind of uh, talking over it. That's yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do that. Let's. So uh, I'm Colin from Flying Colors Maths. Yeah, and I'm Dave. I am uh, Reflective Maths on Twitter. And we are wrong but useful. And we'll see you next month. Yep. Yeah, thanks for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>